In this video, I want to talk about using floaters. Floaters are sort of an old school technique for adding additional detail. It was more useful when it was harder to add things in, like round features smoothly integrated into flat surfaces. You could think of, you know, screws or something like this even. So what we're going to do is we're basically going to trick the normal bake into thinking we have more detail in the high poly than we do, and we're going to use our little vent high to do it. So I've already got my gun high imported. I'm going to go ahead and import my vent high FBX and tap the W key with it selected, and I'm just going to scoot it out. So we can see that's what it looks like as we would expect. I'm going to go to the side view go to face mode and I'm just going to trim it up a little bit here. Oh, you know what? It looks like I might have something with my symmetry. So let me turn that off. Back to face mode. Actually, let me make sure I didn't punch out any. Nope. Okay, good. So I just want to make sure that the faces that I'm leaving behind are flat. Like I, I, I wouldn't want to come in and start deleting some of these where we're already lifting off the surface because again kind of the magic of the bake is we want to make sure that we have a nice clean flat surface that our geometry is being smoothly integrated into. So just to make sure that everything is going to stack nicely I'm going to go to the vertices and se select the top ones go to my uh, scale and we'll just scale those flat. You can see there's a little bit of a warble here so I'm going to scale that flat and then over here I suspect because that's the edge of the plane that's fine but just to be safe go ahead and do the same thing. So now I know my borders are all straight lines and I'm going to tap the insert key to move the pivot. I'm going to tap the V key for vertex snap and I'm just going to go ahead and snap my pivot to any of these corners it doesn't really matter. And at this point I can hit control D once again, control D for duplicate, hold the V key for a vertex snap when I move and it will be perfect, right? We don't have any seams that are getting in the way here. I'm going to do this a couple more times. And one more time. And it's important that the we don't have any rotations here. Well, I guess we got a, 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 a 90 degree rotation, but it's still oriented in world space. That's going to be important here in a, in a minute, and I'll, I'll show you why. Let's go ahead and make a second row over here. So I'm just hitting Control D, holding the V key, and snapping it into place. I've got a little bit of a misalignment here and here. Kind of cost of doing business when we're dealing with so many polygons that are so small, but it's an easy fix. Okay, so here is our vent high duplicated trimmed and now I'm going to go ahead and do mesh combine and I'm going to go ahead and delete the history on it and when I do that we lose our transform so it's important that uh, everything is is where it should be and then I'm going to go ahead and turn on the grid and I'm going to hold uh, X for grid snap so now I can be reasonably certain that this is centered in the scene and so now what I need to do is I basically I just gotta get it in here and then rotate it and kind of scale it so that it fits in this back area here but I don't actually want to do any of that rotation stuff or even the the scaling too much yet uh, what I want to need to do first is I've got to orient this plane to be perfectly parallel with what's going on on the surface which is flat this would be a lot harder in fact probably impossible if I was dealing with the surface that wasn't flat so that's just an FYI so what I'm gonna do I need to get the I basically need to isolate one of these faces so I'm just gonna duplicate it 
here we've got our duplicate. I'm going to go into face mode and select one of the faces here that is pointing in the direction that I need to sample. And then I'm going to go to select inverse. So now I have all of the other faces selected aside from the one that I actually need. And I'm just going to tap delete. So now I have this one face here, don't have to worry about the pivot, and then I've got this geometry that I want to orient to this face. I'm actually going to just hide the gun so we don't have any confusion around what we're dealing with here. And at this point I need to go to my uh, rigging menu and I'm going to go to constrain. And inside constrain I'm going to be looking at a normal constraint. So I'm going to open up the, uh, open up the options for that. You can see I've already got it here. And by default, I think it's going to be, the aim vector will be uh, 1 in x. If you look at this, you can see down here, x is going this way. I want to be dealing with this way, uh, the, the z vector. So I'm going to go ahead and say a 1 in z. So then you just select what we're going to be sampling, select the object we want to modify, and hit apply. Oh, I forgot to set my x to 0. So we, we just want to be working in one axis here, the z-axis. Try that again. And there you can see, if I go to my right view, these things are perfectly parallel now. So that's going to make it way easier to line this up. So you can see I've got these little blue boxes here in my rotation, and that's because I have the, the constraint is basically blocking these things, so I can't come in and modify these because these attributes are now driven by the orientation of this face. Now that I've got this here, I don't need to worry about this guy anymore. I'm just going to go ahead and delete the history. I can delete that face, and I preserve all of my rotation information. So now I can come back over and show gun high. Now if I had chosen to use any of these surfaces here that are oriented in world space, this would not have been necessary, but it's much more interesting to do it this way. And so now we can come in and so long as we are using, we don't, we don't modify the rotation, we can actually, you see I'm, I don't want to go over that little crevice there, All right, whatever. And in the once people are seeing this, they'll never know that we've modified the scale anyway. It's just going to feel like a completely normal feature. Now the other thing that's kind of important here is we want to make sure that we're as close to the surface as we can be without actually going through it. And that'll be, uh, the reason for that will be apparent in a moment. Basically what will happen is if you've got a gap here, you're going to cast a little bit of a shadow in the ambient occlusion bake, which, uh, which may end up showing up in the, uh, the final product. So here is our new detail that we are adding to our existing high poly geometry. So the next thing that we need to think about is how are we going to set up the naming convention so the salt bakes in a way that it should. Because we've got gun high, and gun high is talking to uh, the low poly mesh that's got its own matching gun high. So what we could do is we could combine these two things, but it's not necessary. And in fact, it's not unusual to have a situation where your high poly geometry, you might have like, in this case, we've got gun high and we've got gun low. But imagine if gun high was like 10 million polygons and you had to break it up into a few different pieces. So you wanted like five different high poly meshes to speak to one low poly mesh. The way we do that, it's very simple. You leave the name as it is, and then you just append a number to the back of it. So I'm going to copy this. We're going to rename this gun high 02. So when g gun low is looking for what high polys it should be looking for to bake its information from, it'll see 01 and 02 and basically bake them uh, at the same time. So we get the benefit of lighter individual meshes, but still the ability to control what is baking onto what. So I'm going to go ahead and export this. File, export selection, and we want to do this as OBJ because we're going to be dealing with the normals here. And I'm just going to put a gun high vents OBJ as the name. And then here in Substance Painter, what we're going to do is go to our texture set settings and our bake mesh maps. We'll get rid of the old high poly that's in there. And we'll go find the one that we just made, gun high vents, uh, dot obj. We'll go ahead and just double check 
We've got by mesh name turned on, low high turned on. We're not messing with the ID map because we didn't actually throw an ID color on that thing anyway. And now we'll go ahead and hit bake selected textures. And here it is in its new state with that information from our additional geometry baked in. So it looks pretty good. There's a little bit of a boundary and the place where that boundary is probably coming from, we can just run through our, our bakes here. So I don't see anything obvious in the normal map. So that one came out fairly clean. World space looks good. ID is from the, uh, the original bake. Here we have some artifacting. It's not really an artifact. It's just the, that, that plane casting a shadow and it's in the ambient occlusion. So that's where that one's getting picked up. And then curvature looks good, position's fine. And the thickness is also catching the fact that there's a little tiny plane there. And it's conceivable that that may be causing a problem. But what, what you can do is, uh, if you're really motivated to, to fix this, is you could go in, uh, export the ambient occlusion in the same way that we exported the normal map in the previous video, and just clean up in Photoshop and you can just re-import as a texture and then just drag it into the slot. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mess with that, but hopefully uh, this process is clear enough that you'll be able to go through and, and uh, add your own additional features if you would like. There's one additional thing that's worth mentioning. Uh, this is uh, this is ZBrush, and this tutorial clearly does not cover any ZBrush. But I have these uh, insert mesh brushes that I that I use periodically in ZBrush for exactly the thing that I'm talking to you guys about. This uh, this idea of a of a floater. You don't have to actually in ZBrush use it uh, floating above the surface. It's pretty easy to integrate it into the geometry, but this is a really good example of uh, a concept I'm not sure if I if I covered completely, which is that you can go up and you can go down. It's uh, The normal map is just going to measure the relative change in the surface. It doesn't really care which direction that you are going. So here in Painter, I've already got the stuff baked, and you can see we are getting a little bit of AO kind of underneath it, which is probably not something that you would you would want like all this crap here. I I wasn't super careful as you can see we're all you know everything's kind of floating above. But um the result is still pretty good, right? Like we're getting a lot of of read here that looks like it's positive and negative. And the other thing about doing it this way with the actual geometry built into the or included in the hard surface is if I do come in and add a smart material or anything really that's got a, like a procedural procedural component to how the wear is being calculated, like whatever, we can grab this one. It'll automatically see all of your bakes. Whereas if you use a stamp, you can actually plug the generators into uh, or the, the the updated normal into the generators, but it's not quite as easy. There's there's a few steps you can you can certainly find a video on YouTube. But anyway, so that's the advantage of putting in the geo is it shows up automatically in your curvature and normal map and all the rest of that stuff, so that it it gets calculated by default with whatever procedural generation you decide to apply to your textures. So, okay, with that I will conclude my conversation on floaters.